Greetings, Internet friends. Welcome to another episode of the Synergy Cafe online show featuring speaker, entertainer, close-up illusionist, and marketing alchemist, Magic Brad. It's the Internet Lifestyle Show about career, finance, relationships, spirituality, and wellness. We're moving the online chatter over to real-life activity. And now, please welcome your host of Synergy Cafe, Magic Brad. Hey, Internet friend, Magic Brad here with Synergy Cafe and the Synergy Collaborative. Make sure you turn up your sound so you can hear what's going on here on Synergy Cafe. And I'm here again with our friend Perry Marshall. Are you there, Perry? I am here. It's great to be here. Thanks for having Yay, me today. Yes, and we have a beautiful, beautiful sunny day, and I hear you got some sun over there in the Windy City area. It is Chicago, right? Do. I am in Chicago. Chi Town. <laughs> so I want to talk more about your book. Uh, the last interview that was just uh, the basic one. It's it's a fascinating book. The concept to me of the digital world growing like the organic world does and measurable is from what I understood. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, th this huge epiphany that happened to me in 2004 when I went down the evolution rabbit hole, which which was very scary. Like, I, I really didn't know where this was going to take me. Um, I uh, my brother had um, he like he was a toe the line guy. He was a, you know, obey the rules and we grew up, we were pastor's kids and we grew up in church and yep, I was always kind of zigzaggy. Mm -hmm. Um, not extremely so. I mean, like I was never into cocaine and hookers or, you know, <laughs> I, I didn't do any, anything like oh, that. Oh, that kind of zigzag. <laughs> That's okay. But I certainly ex explored things, um, in all kinds of different ways. And, and uh, you know kind of color outside the lines and stuff brian on the other hand i mean he was like he was right with the program and when he finished his history degree he went to seminary he went to a very conservative seminary he got a, a master's degree in theology and then he moved to china and, and there he is he's teaching english and he's a missionary and um well his faith starts unraveling and um and with within a couple of years he's like really uh like throwing chucking stuff out the window and i'm still a christian and i think all this is great but 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 like the questions and questions they're stacking up there's more and more of them and so the long story short is i said well i'm 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 going to go to what I know, which is science, because I'm an electrical engineer. All these theological, spiritual questions are all really squishy, uh, and I'm just not feeling like I have any solid like. But engineering, I can get that, and and so I don't know. Let's see. Are all these atheists right? Are all these Darwinists right? Like, is is life just a happy chemical accident? Hold. hold do you have your book with you? Yes. Hold I your do. book up so people know what the heck we're talking about. <laughs> so we're talking about the book Evolution 2.0, Breaking the Deadlock Between Darwin and Design, which is the culmination of all these searchings. And um, and I said, I, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. And I know what it feels like to get to the bottom of things. I, I really learned this in engineering school, and I learned it even more when I got out on the job that there are certain things that are absolutely true and that absolutely work. And there's certain things that don't and evolution, the way it was described to me did not make sense because what, what they said was, Hey, you got enough billiard balls banging around in the universe. Uh, eventually life is going to form once life gets going and replication gets going you know, there's going to be copying errors, there's going to be differences, and some of them are better, some of them are worse. And you have this nonstop continuous improvement sh machine fueled by natural selection and multiplication of cells, and, and you get us. And I'm like, engineering has never, ever worked that way in my experience. Right. So either I know something they don't know, or they know something I don't know. So I said, I'm going to find out. And, and, it, and if, like, if there's some principle 
or there's something I'm not getting, I'm going to get it. And either the engineers are going to learn something or the biologists are going to learn. I don't know what's going to happen here, <laughs> but I, I'm going to, I'm going to follow the evidence wherever it leads. But isn't there something to be said for that as above, so below kind of thing? You know, the microcosm uh, equals the more. macro. Well, the microcosm equals the macrocosm kind of oh, thing. Oh, well, actually, I think that's very true. And, and, and in fact, in fact, the, the universe is fractal. Fractal meaning patterns within patterns within patterns within patterns within patterns. In other words... Yeah, and it goes both can, ways. You it gets can, smaller it, yes, or bigger. It, 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 it does. And, and you can look at a little... It's raining outside. You, you can look at a little puddle running a, you know, from your sidewalk through the corner of your yard. And, that, and, and the, there's a little stream of water. And it's indistinguishable from a river seen from the air, from an airplane. Okay. Right. Or, you know, the branching patterns of the cells in a leaf of a tree are pretty much the same as the branching pattern of the, the whole entire tree. And, and so the, uh, now and that, is that also like the branching pattern of like a freeway system or something that's man-made? Well, yeah, except, except that, you know, there's different things have different branching patterns. So, so different trees will have different kinds of fractal patterns. Um, you know, a fractal pattern of humans is triangles and squares. And you look at all the different cities and there's big triangles and there's little ones. I mean, excuse me, <laughs> rectangles and squares, not triangles, yeah, okay. uh, rectangles. Uh, right. And, and, and so, and so there are patterns in nature. And so I, I'm, I'm going to, so I'm, I'm getting to your code question. So I'm floundering around and I'm really struggling with this. And one day, I, um, I'm reading about DNA and trying to understand DNA mutations and learning about the genetic code. And all of a sudden, bam, I have this big epiphany. In fact, I'm going to grab a book from behind. Okay. Me. I, I wrote this book and I don't want people to go out and buy this book, by the way. I just <laughs> want to show it to you. Okay. Don't it's buy this It's called industrial ethernet. Okay. Unless okay. you're an industrial engineer, don't bother. Okay. Right. It's, it, it might help you sleep at night. Um, but <laughs> But I wrote this book in, in 2002, and it's all about how the ones and zeros go back and forth on the wire. And by the, I wrote this for the world's largest professional association of process engineers, because I was in that business. And so they said, we need a book about this. I, I wrote that book. Okay. And so, <laughs> now, it seems really boring, but, you know, if you can actually get into it, it's really fascinating you, this makes the digital age work. You're you're driving down the freeway and you're talking on your cell phone or you're listening to Spotify or whatever, and the cell phone towers are feeding you the signals. People have no idea all of the measures that the communication engineers take to make sure that that signal goes from there and gets to you intact mm -hmm. and goes the other. It's unbelievable sophistication of error correction and all this kind of stuff that goes on. It's ones and zeros. And, and yeah. I had this big epiphany. It's like, wait a minute. Digital code in the cell operates on the same set of identical principles as digital code on an Ethernet cable or a wireless router or Wi-Fi. See, I, I had this idea or thought, because I, I read something about people being able to create computers with the binary system using water molecules because of the H2O is ones and zeros. Is that? Well, <laughs> so that's, you're, you're a little out of my depth. Here's, here's what I can just say about that. Water does have memory. Um, and th there's, there's some very interesting studies about that. And, um, and the, the DNA um, is it into intimately related to the properties of water and in digital code. So, you know, everybody knows there's ones and zeros. Well, in, in biology, there's four, there's A, C, G, and T. And you take those four letters and you can say anything just like with the two letters of binary that we can encode any kind of signal or audio or video or, or whatever documents you are on your computer. And mm -hmm. it's just, it's just adding codes inside of codes inside of codes inside of codes. And so 
I suddenly realized, hey, all the math and all the same basic ideas are identical. I can figure this out. This now starts to make sense. In fact, that, that whole metaphor has been serving me very well ever since. And, and there's an entire field, it's called bioinformatics. And it's the intersection of biology and computer science. Wow. Um, and it exists because of this. I mean, there's bioinformatics journals and you can major in bioinformatics at a lot of universities. And so, and so really what Evolution 2.0 is, is it's, kind of, it's like bioinformatics and evolution for regular people um, and how do we figure this out? Like, what is really going on here? Is, is some of this stuff kind of related to, like, the I Ching, where you just throw these coins and they'll kind of predict the pattern of the future? Mm, don't know. Okay. <laughs> That's, again, again you're, you're kind of outside of, you're, you're outside of my knowledge base there. Um, but but what, what cells do... I, I wouldn't say they predict the future, but they certainly anticipate the future or they prepare for the future. Back so, for example, so for example, um, if you blast cells with X-ray radiation, it will break the DNA and break the chromosomes and cause birth defects. However, um, a lady named Evelyn Whitkin found out in the 1940s that if she gave a little mild dose of x-ray radiation and then came back a few hours later and applied more, the cells would switch on their error correction and protection circuitry and they would resist wow. the damage from the x-rays. And this is a basic quality that living things have mm -hmm. that non-living things don't. So I get it. your ethernet your Ethernet routers and all that kind of stuff, they have air correction and they have air protection, but they don't have dynamically evolving, responding, anticipating air correction, okay? So, like, living things are doing things that are a whole level beyond what humans even know how to make. So evolution is not, not, not a random accidental, it's, it's not the way it's been described to most people. Most people have been told, well, fill your ball banging around the universe and survival of the fittest and it all just gets better and better. No, I was right. As an engineer, no, it does not work that way. Nothing works that way. The mystery was, no, these cells actively adapt to their environment. They evolve in the same way that your body adapts to exercise, okay, mm -hmm. right? So if you and I decided we're going to be marathon runners, we all decide next June we're going to run in a marathon or something. Well, so we get out there and we start pounding the pavement, and like for two weeks our body is like hating us, right? <laughs> and we're miserable and we're achy, but then what happens? We start adding muscle mass, our body starts adapting, our me metabolism starts changing, Three or four minutes later, we start liking going out on our runs and we feel that flow. And it's like my body was made to do this and it just becomes really great. Well, that would be an analogy to what living things do when they're under stress. At first, you know, it's horrible and it kills a lot of them, but some of them adapt. And then pretty soon, they are actually building mechanisms, building systems to resist whatever's going on and to adapt to it. And they actually get better instead of worse, just like your body does. So is, but is, it's, it's in the, it's in the, it's in the long-term sense of, okay, my, my progeny is going to improve from this. My great grandchildren are going to improve from this. This is going on in real time. What's that? <laughs> this is going on in real time. Yeah. Like all the time. So I'm assuming you've seen the movie, the the Matrix movie. Yes. Oh yeah, one of my so, favorite movies. So it's it's kind of that kind of thing where there's this organic thing happening, and then there's this numerical digital thing happening, and they're kind of doing the same thing at the same time. And if we can realize that it's not an enemy, we are all one, and you can kind of work together with these computers. <laughs> well, you know, I, I like how you you bring up the Matrix because. 
you know, yeah, I think a lot of people are living in the matrix. I mean, that movie yeah. resonates with so many people and you, you get done watching that movie for the first time. You're like, I think this is, there's something eerily familiar about this movie. It's like, yeah. it's, it's telling me a basic truth. And, and I think, I think most people are kind of sleepwalking through life and like living in a state of hypnosis and not really what's going on realize what's going on so yeah, that's what my friend like, paul Sheely says that we're all in a trance and it's a matter of getting out of the trance by hypnotizing yourself into a different state of mind <laughs> right and and so so like i, I it, an example of the trance is the neo darwin story okay yeah. that well you know all you need is a bunch of copying errors anybody that can believe that is in a trance Okay, now I know I, I realize I probably feel like I'm insulting somebody. Well, <laughs> listen, listen, just just use some common sense. Have you ever seen any time, like all of us, we use computers, we use cell phones. Most of us have been using this stuff for 20 years as part of our daily life. Have you ever seen a corrupted computer file get better? Is, is, there, is there a single program on the internet that got better by random copying errors and like why doesn't bill gates buy a million computer servers randomly just shove code into it let natural selection sort it out and spit out software on the other <laughs> side why does he need why does he need programmers right well what, what i want to tell you is that every single cell in your body is a programmer mm -hmm. A bacterium can do more programming in 12 minutes than a team of Google engineers can do in 12 weeks. Sure. And, and so this, like, this should make you wake up. Whoa. <laughs> How did this happen? What does this tell me about my life? What does this tell me about the world? What does this tell me about where this all came from? So, like, evolution, evolution doesn't support atheism well what Come about on. what about the computers and like the artificial intelligence kind of thing because i know i've had situations where software just didn't work and i had to reboot it and reboot it and pretty soon it starts working and i had a weird facebook situation happen where uh me and a friend were messaging back and forth and we we're going to meet tomorrow at four o'clock okay. all of a sudden facebook sent a thing that said videl just uh, confirmed your message and he goes how did you make that happen i go i didn't do it it, it just knew that we were setting an appointment. Wow. All right. Well, so that's <laughs> the world of AI, right? That's you talk into Siri. Um, you, you talk to um, Alexa, right? The Amazon yeah. Echo thing. And, uh, you know, and in some cases, the machine can recognize and parse human speech better than humans can because there's all of this accumulated learning. Now, I, I want to point something out that everybody needs to understand. None of this happens by itself. None of this happens by accidents. What's happening when Siri or Alexa get to the point where they get better and better and better and better? What's going on is that layers and layers and layers and layers of intelligence have been programmed into the system to where now the system is sophisticated to become self-checking or self-learning but the system and this is the key the system has no will of its own right it was programmed by a programmer and the programmer was actually programmed by the all that is superior being Right, right. <laughs> the program possesses, it's not a self. So you, you throw a, a, a steak on your kitchen table and you look at your dog and you say, don't you eat that? And he looks at you like, mm. <laughs> right? And, and you, you can look at him. You can walk out of the room and you can tell he's deciding whether he's going to obey you and not eat the steak or if he's going to disobey you <laughs> and climb on the table and eat the steak. And, and your dog is making a choice right you understand 
Siri doesn't make that choice. Your computer doesn't make that choice. Alexa doesn't make that choice. It's all just obeying completely prescribed rules. But when you go to the world of living things, you're not dealing in deterministic systems anymore. You're not dealing with purely obeying algorithms anymore. You're dealing, so your dog is a self and you are a self. And I would submit to you that every cell is a self. The cells in your body are agreeing in some sense to cooperate with each other. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that they brush their teeth at night before they go to bed and say their prayers. Like, I'm not saying they're consciously self-aware. I, don't, I really have no idea. But there is some animal awareness all the way down to the cellular level. And really, this is the only sensible explanation for why living things do what they do. They are selves. So this stuff is just frying my brain because this is stuff that I've thought about for a long time. The, the, the yin Everybody's and the yang. thought about it. Yeah, it's pretty Everybody's wild. Everybody's thought about <laughs> this. And, and, and I, I hopefully, I'm giving language and scientific rigor to this. Yeah. And so like so one one of the one of the realizations that I had very quickly as soon as I I made the connection hey wait a minute ethernet dna like they basically work the same way well guess what you know there's a million codes there's barcodes and zip codes and qr codes and html codes and chinese and english <laughs> There's a million codes, 999,999 are designed by humans. And one of them, we don't know where it came from, and it's called DNA. And it's more sophisticated than all the other codes that, that I was just <laughs> talking about. So the inference is that it's designed. Now, so I started, I started uh, debating this on, on the internet. Now, there's... Um, Brad, there's a really interesting experiment that I did because I kind of realized, you know what? I can live in my own bubble and I can come up with my own theories, but I really got to subject these to scrutiny. And I want the whole world to be able to hammer on these ideas and pound all the slag off of them. So if there's a flaw in my logic, somebody is going to find it. <laughs> so, he, so, so here's what I did. And I, I had a variety of reasons for doing this. But I, um, I wrote a email autoresponder series called Where Did the Universe Come From? I gave a talk called if you can read this i can prove god exists i actually gave the talk at the largest church in chicago willow creek and i put this online and i started driving google traffic to it so i wrote a book on google adwords i'm a google adwords guy i'm buying google clicks thousands of clicks every day and they were pretty cheap at the time they're not anymore but they were then and i'm buying all these clicks and people are getting in this email sequence and they're getting these messages and when they would reply to an email, I would get it. I would get the reply. And so I decided I will engage with any reasonable person who disagrees with me. If they've got manners and they have a reasonable argument to make, I'm going to engage. And so, so I've got, here's what happens. I've got like more than 100 people every day signing onto this email sequence. And this went on for years. This email list got up to 175,000 people. Okay. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm serious. Like, like I, I hope you get how serious this project was. Sure. And it is. And so I'm getting all these replies. And um and and I've got this talk. If you can read this, I can prove God exists. And you know, I I'm DNA is a code, all the other codes are designed, therefore DNA is designed. So I'm out there with this argument. I got pulled onto the largest atheist discussion board in the world, which at the time was called Infidels in 2005. And this guy started arguing with me. I was backing him into a corner. He got flustered. He goes onto this and he posts a link to my talk. And he's like, here, be nice to Perry Marshall while you rip him to shreds. Okay. And, and here we go. And I'm like, oh, oh no. 
Like, I didn't want this. Like, oh, don't kid yourself, Perry. Of course you wanted this. You, you designed <laughs> this to happen. You just didn't realize, you just didn't realize it was going to turn out like this. Like, okay. So off I go. So I am defending myself. Well, this became the longest running, most viewed thread in the entire history of the largest atheist discussion board in the world. This went on from 2005 to 2012, um, when eventually they sold the site to somebody else and they shut it down and stuff. But this this went on for years, and it was one of me. There was all these atheists, and you know what they're like? They're like no manners <laughs> and, and all this kind of stuff. But I just I persistently and politely defended myself, defended myself. If if you if you go to cosmicfingerprints.com, which is my website, and search infidels, you'll find like several articles about this, and I got it wow. all documented. They could not punch a hole in my argument at all. Like they 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 couldn't provide a counterexample. They couldn't dismantle it. See, I can relate well, to that because back when AOL was popular, I was on an atheist chat board, and they were saying that God doesn't exist. God doesn't exist, and I said. Well then, what are we talking about? <laughs> and well, then they get right, that. Right. <laughs> yeah, and, and then look, I, I, I really the the atheist world has to borrow from the theist world in order to make all their arguments. But, but anyway, um, but but I want to fast forward it and tell you where that this this has come. Okay. I I came to realize, you know, I've got what uh, the philosophers call a god of the gaps argument, and there's a problem with god of the gaps arguments. Okay. And I'll tell you a little story about this, because this is actually really important. Um, when Isaac Newton worked out all of his equations of motions, and he figured out gravity, and he figured out the trajectories of planets and all this stuff, his calculations said that the planets should eventually wobble off their course and get unstable, and and so... Like this, his equation said this. So, he's, so he, he reasoned, you know, God must like push him back every now and then. Okay. <laughs> well, a guy, a guy named Laplace came along later and he fixed the math and he said, no, God doesn't have to come and, and fix this. Like it happens all by itself. You just didn't have your equations right. Well, um, if so, if if Newton's wrong math was causing people to believe in God, that's like not a good reason to believe in God. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But that's, that's, that's a shaky, that's a shaky basis for a faith system. And, um, and it's because of an accounting is, error. <laughs> what? It's because of an, an accounting error. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. And, you know, and for all I know, it could be that the origin of life and our ability to in our inability to explain it as a counting error. I don't know. I mean, there's so much we don't know. Like, it could be that life would naturally arise. Now, I can tell you this. Today, nobody knows how. Um, and most, most of what you hear about this is kind of made up, okay? Or it's highly, highly speculative. So I put together a technology prize. I said, you know what? If this is solvable, I want to solve it. If it's not solvable, I want everybody to know without any shadow of a doubt that it hasn't been solved. And so I went to a great deal of trouble, and I mean a great deal of trouble. And I put together a private equity investment group, and I went around to investors, and I started raising money. And I have this thing. It's called the Evolution 2.0 Prize. And uh, the details on it are at naturalcode.org, and we're offering a $3 million prize for wow. origin of information. And if you can if you can solve chemicals to code, we'll write you a check for a hundred thousand dollars. And if you can solve chemicals to code and whatever you came up with is patentable, we will patent it. We will buy the rights of the patent from you for three million dollars and bring you on as a um, as a shareholder in our company. Wow. And and so this is this is a very serious thing and lawyers and securities and exchange commission regulations and all this kind of stuff um, that we've done because uh, one of the things that inspired me to do this was 
Uh, about 10 years ago, I was listening to the radio and Richard Dawkins was being interviewed on one of the NPR stations. And somebody, he's the world's most famous atheist. And somebody said, so where did life came, come from? And Richard Dawkins says, life was a happy chemical accident. And then he went on in his British accent to just like make up more stuff. And I listen to that and I'm like, happy chemical accident? <laughs> You've got to be crazy. Sure. You've got to be kidding. I, I, can't, I can't believe you just said that. So OPEX oil spill. <laughs> at the time, this was a guy, this was an Oxford professor with a special chair uh, and a distinction as the professor of the public understanding of science. I'm like, excuse me, this is the public misunderstanding of science. This is an insult to Oxford University. This is an insult to every thinking person, every creating person, anybody who ever built anything, because things like cells don't happen by accident. And I said, you know what? If, if one of the world's leading intellectuals is getting away with saying this in public, if he's not being thrown out of the radio station for saying something so absurd, we have a major problem and somebody's got to do something about this. We, we can't, like science, scientists can't make up <laughs> stories like this and call this science. This is a disservice to everyone. Like he's not doing his job. Got it. He's well, not even taking his job seriously. Well, that uh, million dollar challenge thing sounded of interest. That sounds like a whole nother topic, but uh, we've gone for a while and I got to beam this thing up. I got another interview I have to do. So could you show your book again? This is a fascinating book. I went out to buy it at uh, the Barnes and Noble over here, but they didn't have it. So oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, I ordered online. You know, maybe, <laughs> maybe some of them don't have it in stock, but it's on Amazon. Well, it might've been sold it's out. It's on Audible. It's on Kindle. It's called Evolution 2.0, Breaking the Deadlock Between Darwin and Design by Perry Marshall. My website is CosmicFingerprints.com. You can get three free chapters of the book on the homepage at CosmicFingerprints.com. And I think this book will, like, it'll really fire your imagination. Oh, it already has. It's fascinating. So I'm going to sign this one off and beam it up to the universe, and we'll let it propagate and create a life of its own. <laughs> Hey, well, Brad, thank you for having me on. It's a real honor to be on your show. Love the questions that you're asking. And I just want to invite everybody, be curious and ask big questions. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when things don't make sense, then, you know, keep pursuing them and, until you figure it out. Yeah, critical thinking. So if you, uh, in the future you got something else you want to come up with, just you know how to get a hold of me and uh, we can do another one. This is This is fun and fascinating. So... Perry, I appreciate well, you taking you. the time again. Thank you very much for being on Synergy Cafe. See you, Brad. Peace. Thanks. Bye.